Okay, in the spirit of uh, Ed Kern's now quote, I'm going to tell you what the research community is smoking these days. Uh, my name is Nick Feimster. I'm a graduate student at MIT. I'm going to tell you about some work that I did with Jennifer Rexford and Jay Borkenhagen from AT&T. This talk is essentially about uh, good BGP traffic engineering practices. Uh, we're, I'm going to talk mostly about the types of BGP import policy changes uh, that are good and some which are not good. So the contributions of this work are, are really twofold. Uh, the first is really what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so in this work, we propose a set of BGP traffic engineering practices um, that scale well, um, that allow operators to make predictable changes to traffic flows, um, and that do so even in the presence of neighboring ASs, which may be doing things that you can't always predict. So the second contribution is, uh, is a tool for predicting uh, how e egress routes change uh, in response to these BGP import policy changes uh, using an offline algorithm. Um, and I can refer you to some of that work if you're interested. Okay, so if you don't know why interdomain traffic engineering might be interesting, there's uh, there's going to be a panel on it tomorrow morning, uh, but I'll give you a little primer now. There are several companies, obviously, that are interested in doing this these days. But uh, some of the main reasons you might be interested in doing this uh, are if you, if you have congestion on some of your edge links, uh, you may wish to, to shift traffic around to alleviate some of this congestion. Uh, you know, as provisioning changes on these links, you may want to direct traffic you know, towards links that where provisioning has increased. And you may wish to alter the end-to-end -end path uh, to various prefixes to achieve better end-to-end -end performance. So in sloshing this traffic around, there are really two main options. You could shift traffic among the links to a single AS, or you could shift traffic you know, among all your links, uh, maybe to a different AS. So I'll talk about good ways to do both of these. So the first thing to realize uh, when you're doing, when you're sloshing this traffic around is you really have to pay attention to, uh, you know, where you're sloshing your traffic to because you don't want to violate um, commercial constraints. Um, certainly you don't want to uh, take traffic on, off one of your peering links because it's congested and then end up sending it through one of your customers or something like this. So um, we got to pay attention to this carefully. So as a general overview, uh, we're trying to change our outbound traffic patterns by tweaking BGP import policies. Well, one alternative might be to just get rid of BGP, but um, many of you probably wouldn't be very happy if we shut the internet off one day and brought it up the next something else. And uh, we don't have any better ideas with what to bring it up with anyway, so let's just stick with BGP and see what we can do. So what types of uh, BGP import policy changes are, are considered good? Well, there's, there's, there's several criterion by which you can consider a route to, or uh, an import policy change to be good or bad. So good changes uh, should really impose a minimal amount of management overhead and also a minimal amount of uh, traffic as far as you know, sending out new BGP updates. The changes we make should result in predictable changes in the traffic flows. And the changes we make should try to minimize as much as possible uh, the, our neighbors' reactions to our own changes. So really what we're interested in is trying to model uh, what's coming out uh, on our egress links as far as traffic loads given five different inputs, um, several of which operators have little to no control over. Um, it, uh, operators don't have much control over 
routing advertisements that neighbors are giving to them at any given time for a prefix. Uh, not much control over the network topology. Or, um, you know, there's limited control as to the quantity of, uh, you know, the balance of traffic that you're getting on the inbound traffic links. So there are a few things that, that we can play with in response to this to uh, try to shift the traffic around on, on these links within our network and on the outbound edge links. Uh, one is that we can tweak the IGP configuration within the network, but when we're uh, shifting traffic on these outbound links, it's generally easier to do this with BGP import policies. Well, how can we even uh, hope to model this or predict what's going to come out of this black box uh, when a lot of the inputs we're dealing with are rather unpredictable? Um, and even what's inside this, this box can be unpredictable itself. Uh, for example, if the if router is not configured correctly, BGP decision process may not be deterministic itself. So, so how can we make some of these inputs and, and the box itself more predictable so we can hope to model what's coming out as far as traffic loads? So there's some further difficulties that, that we also have to deal with. Um, the first is difficulties with the protocol itself. There's, uh, the message advertisements don't include any sort of metric as far as, uh, you know, as, far as performance is concerned. Uh, so uh, traffic engineering is essentially manual. Uh, this, the second set of difficulties that we're dealing with are related to the configuration itself. So essentially what we're trying to do is influence the router's selection for best route to a prefix uh, given only our handle on uh, these import policies. So we're trying to set attributes uh, you know, on these routing advertisements that we hear. Uh, and in, in such a way where we only have an indirect uh, capability of influencing which route a particular router picks for a particular prefix. The third set of limitations that we're dealing with are limitations with the BGP decision process itself. Namely, uh, splitting traffic in many instances can be, can be difficult, and uh, interacting with the IGPs also introduces a fair amount of complexity. And there are also these commercial relationship constraints, which I alluded to earlier. So I, asked, I posed the question before of how to actually make some of these inputs more predictable. Well, the first thing we want to do is uh, is make sure our routers are configured correctly so that you know, given a uh, static uh, snapshot essentially of our configuration and of uh, the set of routing updates we're hearing, we can predict uh, what type of routes are going to be selected. Uh, to do this, we need to make the BGP decision process independent of the ordering of message arrivals. So uh, BGP deterministic med uh, will uh, will allow the current best route advertisement to be compared with all the other best, uh, all the other route advertisements for that prefix. Uh, and therefore, uh, the ordering of these arrivals uh, does not affect which route uh, the router picks. Uh, the second thing we want to do is not use tie breaking based on uh, the oldest route that we've heard for a particular prefix, but rather use uh, the router ID. Um, now, the router ID itself can, can change if routers reboot or things like this, but we're really interested in, you know, given that we have a, a snapshot at a particular time, uh, let's not have to simulate, uh, you know, the order of message arrivals. Let's assume a particular state uh, and see what we can see what we can predict as far as as far as best routes. So, when we're playing with this box and uh, tweaking uh, tweaking our inputs and trying to see where where traffic is sloshing around to. Uh, we're also concerned with minimizing the overhead. So to achieve traffic engineering goals, we'd, we'd also like to minimize the frequency of the changes that we're making in order to uh, reduce the, the number of BGP messages that we have to send, as well as uh, operator headaches. Uh, and uh, we also recommend enabling soft reconfiguration or, or route refresh. Uh, such that every time a configuration change is made, 
uh, the session doesn't have to go through a hard reset. So given that we've sort of laid these basic ground rules, uh, the rest of the talk basically focuses on how we're going to adapt uh, these BGP import policies in nice ways such that we can predict what's going to come out of this box as far as uh, how much traffic is coming out on each of our egress links. So really we propose uh, sort of three main areas uh, in which we want to focus. Uh, one is that it's important to consider uh, the scale of the problem. We've got as many as 100,000 prefix, uh, prefixes um, and several advertisements for each one and we don't want to have to uh, set independent policies uh, for each one to try to shift traffic on a prefix by prefix basis. Um, this would lead to particularly long and readable configurations um, and will likely be unstable because uh, you know, it's hard to predict how much traffic is going to be destined for any one particular prefix at any given time. So the second thing we're, we're interested in doing is achieving some, some amount of predictability. And I've alluded to this a little bit, but uh, there's a lot of things that, that, uh, that can happen when, when you make an import policy change, um, particularly if, if your neighbors see the effects of that change. Um, this can affect inbound traffic patterns, et cetera. So we'd like to limit the types of changes that we can make such that when we do make a change, we can predict where our traffic is going to flow. So the third thing is we don't have much control over uh, which routes uh, our neighbors are advertising to us. Um, some of the attributes we don't have control over, much control over, and we don't have much control over how much traffic our neighbors are sending us on, on which links. So, uh, w you know, so what can we do about that? So we basically look at these three problems uh, in, in the context of the data we have available uh, from the AT&T backbone um, and see what types of changes will be better than others under these three guidelines. So we look at routing table data, um, <clears throat> which give us an idea of the advertisements we're likely to see for a particular prefix. We uh, use, use aggregated net flow data to figure out how much traffic is going to each particular prefix over these outbound links. And we look at the configuration files to see uh, what types of policies we're applying to each of these advertisements. Okay, well, not everyone works for AT&T. So uh, what can you do if you don't have this type, of, uh, this type of information available to you? Well, you could use an IBGP monitor to uh, get some idea of, of the route advertisements that are seen for a particular prefix. Um, or uh, some vendors support uh, sending all, all the advertisements heard for a particular prefix to an IBGP monitor. Uh, instead of using NetFlow, you could use uh, packet, packet monitoring or, or some other technique. Uh, and the analysis that we're presenting does apply, uh, you know, even if you only have limited access amount, limited access to this type of data. So the first problem I alluded to uh, was that we've got a large number of prefixes. We'd rather not have to set an import policy on every one and keep changing these as you know, traffic patterns change. So let's look at the traffic characteristics for these prefixes and uh, see which prefixes are carrying uh, the majority of the traffic and only set import policies for these prefixes or these groups of prefixes. So that's what I've shown here in this graph. Um, <clears throat> uh, on the, on the y-axis, we have a cumulative fraction of traffic that, that is being carried for a particular prefix in blue or origin AS in red. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have the cumulative fraction of all origin ASs or prefixes. Okay, so at, at uh, 0.1, 0 0.7 roughly, you can see that 10% uh, you know, of prefixes are uh, responsible for terminating about 70% of the traffic. And if you group these prefixes according to the origin AS that advertises them, 10% uh, you know, of, the, of those origin ASs terminate about uh, you know, just over 80% of the traffic. So 10% you know, of the origin AS is about 
uh, you know, 1,200 uh, origin ASs or so. This is a much more manageable number than dealing with 100,000 prefixes. Okay, so the second problem we're interested in dealing with is making predictable changes to the import policy. Okay, so the first problem is that the traffic that our neighbors are offering us on, on our inbound links is, is changing over time. Um, so if I'm changing import policies based on these uh, prefix advertisements, the obvious solution is to change our policies for the prefixes uh, which carry a roughly predictable amount of traffic uh, from week to week. So which prefixes are those? Which, which ones carry a you know, relatively predictable amount of traffic? So it turns out if we look at the prefixes which carry uh, the majority of the traffic, uh, those tend to be more, more stable than, than the prefixes which carry less traffic. I said, for example, the, um, the top 1% of, uh, of the origin, I'm sorry, I said prefixes, but I, I meant uh, origin ASs. So if we look at the uh, top 1% of these origin ASs that, that uh, terminate traffic as far as how much traffic they terminate, uh, these only experience a 10% change in uh, the amount of traffic that they're terminating from week to week. Um, and most of the origin ASs that are responsible for more than 10% of all outbound traffic over these links um, don't change by more than a factor of two. So, um, so focusing your import policy changes on only these sets of prefixes um, may be likely to give you more predictable output as far as uh, how much traffic you're carrying on each of these links. Okay, so the, the next uh, sort of problem we deal with when we look at predictability uh, is that when we make some, uh, some import policy change that affects uh, a router's choice for best route, uh, that change may be visible uh, to our downstream neighbors um, and, and that change may cause them to, in turn, change their mind on where they're sending their traffic. Uh, so in this, in this diagram, if, if, I've, uh, if I've made some change that changes the path for a best route from ASB and that's now using ASA, my downstream neighbor may decide, oh, I'm not going to send traffic to, to, to my network at all. Um, this is going to wreak havoc as far as generating predictable inbound, inbound traffic matrix. So in order to alleviate this kind of problem, we'd like to make import policy changes that shift traffic either to the same AS or if we need to shift to a different AS, uh, at least uh, shift to a path that uses the same path length so this is less likely to uh, change our downstream neighbor's choice for a best route. <clears throat> okay, so what this graph is showing is um, uh, it's the, the cumulative fraction of traffic and prefixes um, for uh, <clears throat> so for a given uh, for a given uh, basically uh, we can see from the graph that about uh, seventy percent of the prefixes uh, have only uh, one distinct next hop AS for the, uh, among the paths they hear for shortest path advertisement. Um, so this is nice because this means that we can play games with our import policies and as long as we uh, shift among paths that uh, are all the, uh, all the length uh, of the shortest path of all the routes we hear, we don't have to worry that our traffic is going to slosh to a different next hop AS. So the next problem we have to deal with uh, is that operators typically want to shift traffic ag aggregates on some finer granularity than, than on a per AS basis, but um, on a more coarse granularity than per path. So for example, um, you know, they'll pick out a chunk of traffic uh, like a, <clears throat> a unit sprint 
uh, path or something like this and shift all of that traffic away from, from a particular link. Okay, so the problem with just with doing this naively is that if you if you pick a specific two hop path and uh, somebody two hops down from you decides to change uh, change their advertisement, um, then the policy that you've just set is has become uh, invalidated <coughs> or not applicable rather. So what we want to do is uh, use regular expressions to uh, try to figure out or try to try to alleviate this problem of this uh, flapping downstream. So the the main thing to to be careful of when we do this sort of thing um, is that you know a 701 uh, you know slash 701 n hop is not is not the same as a 701 m hop. Um, there are different types of of networks and uh, the the amount of traffic that's terminated over networks of, of different paths can vary. Um, so you can probably, if you're feeling astute, you can probably figure out who each of these ASs are. But the point of this, the point of this graph basically shows how much traffic is terminated uh, to each of these ASs over various path lengths. So for example, uh, ASC uh, terminates 100% of its traffic over one hop paths, uh, whereas uh, someone like uh, someone like ASA uh, terminates only 20% of its traffic over one hot paths, and and uh, you know another 25% or another 30% over over two hot paths. Um, so if I want to if I want to shift two hot paths to some particular AS, I have to be careful about what some particular AS is because the change I make um, could have vastly different impact depending on uh, which AS that is. Okay, so the, the last challenge we're trying to address is that, uh, that we don't have a lot of control over advertisements that our neighbors send us. Um, and the AS path length step in the decision process comes fairly early, and by default, it's, it's not something we have much control over. Um, further, in many cases, it's not clear what the difference is between a uh, Two hot path and a three hot path. Um, <clears throat> so, what, in in particular, when we're trying to shift traffic for to achieve various traffic engineering goals, uh, using a, uh, sort of a strict AS path length rule ends up restricting our flexibility because we're ruling out paths that we may want to be able to use to offload our traffic to or from. So if you want to do this sort of thing, we recommend uh, turning off the AS path length step uh, and using a more coarse definition uh, or, or using sort of a more coarse grain metric uh, to apply the AS path length step. Maybe say, you know, two or three hot paths are roughly equivalent, but you know, definitely prefer those over a five hot path. Okay, so uh, so what we're showing here is. Uh, how many how many prefixes here advertisements that here advertisements with paths of more than one distinct length? So we see that about a, a little more over, a little more than 35 percent of all the traffic and a little more than 35 percent of all prefixes uh, here advertisements for more than one distinct length. So uh, this you know, from a traffic engineering mindset, this should raise some flags because uh, in this, for this 35% of prefixes that we want to uh, maybe slosh around, we may be restricting the choices that we have as far as uh, our egress links by ruling out, you know, a particular three hot path because there's a, there's a two hot path that looks better by by the BGP decision process. Um, this this often, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, multiple length paths do uh, come about because of of prepending and and that's actually what I want to talk about next so uh, the issue with with prepending is uh, there are a lot of people that uh, sort of prepend vigorously uh, prepending twelve or or fourteen times is it actually happens <laughs> and uh, 
it's unclear what the difference is between uh, someone who's prepended a route seven times or someone who's prepended a route eight times. You know, as far as uh, doing traffic engineering, if we want to keep our options open, we, uh, we don't necessarily want to pref prefer a seven hop path over an eight hop path. Why don't we just consider those to be equally good? I mean, we definitely want to prefer prefer a one or, one or two hop path over a seven hop path, but uh, using such a coarse grain metric can uh, restrict uh, operator's flexibility. And so the last thing that we're really concerned about is things that our neighbor ASs may do to uh, try to play games with us and restrict our flexibility in, uh, in choosing outbound routes. Uh, games like filtering on some peering points and not others, uh, you know, advertising a next top IP address that's not of the session itself, but um, you know, somewhere across your backbone. Um, we didn't see this happening that much, but uh, if you do, it may be uh, causing you some headaches. So definitely something to look out for. Um, so pay attention. If, pay attention to your advertisements, at, at least, if you haven't been paying attention to me. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> in conclusion, uh, we're pretty much stuck with BGP, so we need to figure out how to do interdomain traffic engineering with it. And that's basically what I've been talking about today, what are, what are good types of import policy changes um, that result in uh, you know, good scaling properties, that result in predictable changes in traffic flow, um, and that allow us to do things despite the fact that our neighbors may be sending us things that we don't want to hear or, or misbehaving in various ways. Um, as I mentioned, there's also a, a, a tool we're developing to uh, do this sort of prediction that I've described offline. Um, I'll refer, I'll refer you to uh, the paper that's also linked from the NANOG website. Um, just one last thing. <clears throat> the research community is also uh, smoking a few other things. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a shameless advertisement. Uh, some of the work I'm doing as a graduate student at MIT involves uh, answering some questions like observing correlations between BGP advertisements and end-to-end -end path failures. But to observe these correlations, uh, we need to have places to observe them from. So that's where you come in. Uh, Randy Bush has, all, has been uh, kind enough to help us out with giving us a point of presence in, in his network as well as uh, an IBHP uh, monitor. Uh, and we'd appreciate it if you would do the same for us. Thank you. Um, since you mentioned the analogy for uh, smoking stuff, uh, who's funding your habit? It's actually DARPA. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to the government. <laughs> Was anyone paying attention? <laughs> Avi, you're leaving. You have a question? No. Ah. Okay. okay, well, that's good. You all have to go out and apply this now since there's no argument. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks.